My name is Bogdan Solga. And I'm Nicola. My, my friend Nicola will present together uh, a, uh, an overview of the challenges of distributed uh, systems or of uh, distributed microservices. Uh, as you might be familiar, this is one of the trending topics for the last years and one of the most debated and debatable topics in terms of why, how, when, where, and why not. So, uh, the main intent of this presentation will be to try to answer a few questions. Uh, why uh, to transition? Why not to transition? Overall, to invite everyone to have a more uh, uh, thoughtful decision uh, whenever you are either thinking or considering or maybe planning for doing that. That's our intent. Hopefully, that won't break. Samar? <laughs> Okay, so uh, that's just briefly uh, a few words about uh, ourselves. Um, Nicola, please. Yes, so maybe a short introduction on how we get to know each uh, we'll other. Get, we'll get to that. Uh, okay. That will be uh, the next couple of slides. I will let you to do the introduction. Okay, thank so, you. Yep. Uh, so it happens that we, uh, we run this presentation, somehow a version of it uh, six months ago yep. at uh, yep. Vox Days in Bucharest. I think it was a very nice event. It was online, and I'm very delighted that now it's, uh, yes, everyone is here. Uh, so challenges of uh, distributed system, but Bogdan and I have a longer history. Yep. Uh, we met in the, let's say, what we call the captive IT service center in Bucharest of a large <laughs> European bank. I'll let you figure out which one it could be, uh, knowing that I'm speaking French. Uh, <laughs> so Bogdan was in charge of uh, uh, all topics related to, let's say, clean coding, uh, refactoring, uh, test-driven development. He's a Java expert. And uh, so he was our software craftsmanship, craftsman in chief. Yep. While at the same time, in parallel, I was kind of the business analyst, uh, expert on everything. And I was acting as a proxy product owner uh, in the IT department that was emerging. So now it's more than 700 people, but at the time it was... Uh, Far, far, far smaller. So we get to know each other because um, you can you can press the, the button. Yep. Yes, because uh, uh, as any uh, uh, let's say IT services or IT uh, company that starts in in, in Bucharest, uh, progressively they, they collect let's say legacy uh, projects, legacy applications, and progressively they become as extended team, and then they become more and more comfortable. They they, they gain uh, confidence on the project and they become, uh, or they get full ownership of the application. And when they get full ownership of the application, this slide. At least some of them uh, have uh, thought and considered, should we transition to those shiny hipster thingies called microservices? Yes, so that's how we get to know each other because a uh, few, few of the, let's say, the teams that we were uh, uh, having the pleasure to, uh, to, uh, to follow were thinking about that about transitioning towards microservices, towards something that uh, allow, allow them to have a, a shiny CV to attract uh, good <laughs> developers in, the, in their teams. So they were defending this type of project in front of product owner, people in France, but it could be, I said it, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it could be anywhere. And they were, uh, they, they had to convince them about the value, the, added, the business value of such a transition, uh, knowing that as we will discuss, there are plenty of uh, challenges. As we will further see, yep. So, um, so obviously it's hard to convince the business uh, stakeholders because for some times there will be a kind of freeze of the new features that you can, uh, you can implement while you, let's say, uh, you develop the, 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 the microservices. You can press the button. Yep. Uh, and uh, and uh, the one. And, uh, and therefore, uh, what we realized, so I think uh, personally had to, the, the, the great pleasure to follow three transition. One was a, a critical middleware application for, for traders. It was successful. That was the first success that a team full ownership and managed to uh, uh, transition to a, a fully uh, microservices based architecture. Then we had two other projects, more like a marketing website and then another one that was a, let's say, a, a short application that was computing a spread for the, for the bank, uh, market spread. And here it was more difficult. So what we realized is that it's very beyond the technicalities of this transition. There are a lot of other aspects, the timing, the added value, uh, to embark your, your sponsor, your product owner into this type of project. So that's kind of the disclaimer before you onboard into this type of, uh, 
uh, project is at sync about all the stakeholders around the application that you will need to convince for some time that they won't see any added value on the solution that you are maintaining, but on the long run, it's beneficial. Essentially, uh, dealing with two challenges, one of them being uh, non-technical, uh, providing an overview of the ad added benefit and the return on investment, especially short, mid-term, and the other one being the technical challenges. So they always come together, intertwined, but we cannot have the second one if we don't settle the first one. So soft skills and uh, a bit to convince and uh, maintain the, the, uh, the, the energy uh, around, uh, around this uh, transition is essential. Yep. Okay. But we'll come back to now to the technical. Exactly. Uh, so in short, uh, now after the hopefully not too long presentation, we'll discuss about challenges of distributed systems. I'll try to clarify the potential uh, distinction, or I don't know, potential confusion between distributed systems and microservices. Subtle, but not entirely. The overall reasoning, providing that high-level overview of evolution of enterprise software architectures, uh, this will be uh, uh, most likely a refresher and a very high-level overview for the technical people. In terms of deployment type, meaning the two standard or the most useful, and sorry, the most common uh, deployment models, the monolithic deployment to the microservices deployments, so from big, huge monsters to tiny and hipster thingies. Uh, communication and data storage models, as far as we will have time for those, because those are, in my opinion, some of the biggest challenges, may, may be the main challenges. Benefits, challenges, trade-offs uh, in these, uh, these two worlds. And also uh, trying to uh, maybe clarify briefly what distributed software systems microservices are. So starting from the beginning, from the highest level up, and then uh, main challenges when migrating a project from that monolithic architecture to a microservices architecture. And especially we will try to answer the biggest questions, at least from my experience, uh, which will be on the next slide. Um, should we start a project using microservices? This is one of the biggest or the most frequent questions that I've ever heard in a lot of contexts. Uh, there, it, there is a lot of uh, uh, potential discussion and uh, the shortest summary, in my opinion, summary and the recommendation is very simple. No, no that we can have a way longer discussion, but no. Should we migrate our project to, the, to use microservices? This is the, the second uh, frequent uh, uh, question that I've heard, of course, depending on the stage of that project. And in here, it's a short answer, but uh, one that is more flavored, it depends. And depending uh, at least on the, what Nicola said and a lot of others. So certainly the second question is, uh, by all means, please migrate. No. So uh, by, by the way, let me connect please. one of the presentations we had this morning, the, which I found very interesting, from Nicolas Frankel. Mm -hmm. He showed that actually the, micro, the transition to microservices can be also partial. You yes. can start with a monolithic application that progressively you, you chop into a microservices, but you, you keep some of the stable part of the application as monolithic that will be deployed only very, or redeploy only very occasionally. And I find this proposal very, uh, very interesting. The strangler pattern, as it might be familiar to some of you, uh, definitely one of the main patterns that can be used, but it also comes with some headaches. So not entirely, uh, there's no such thing as a free meal, right? Um, very high level overview of enterprise applications. Between parentheses, Java applications, because they will be the main focus, but uh, not necessarily without any, I don't know, bounds or uh, direct links to Java world. So medium, large, huge, or maybe in, in there also way beyond huge applications. Um, why they always exist from the same reason? Because they implement a series of business functionalities. They always exist from the same uh, core reason, not because those systems that are cooperating in there are good friends or, I don't know, neighbors, but because they are implementing something that a certain uh, entity, a certain company needs. And uh, in terms of how uh, they are usually, or at least they were usually written in a single programming language, uh, um, because from a series of reasons, uh, packaging and deployment, the part that it's getting closer to where we want to take our uh, uh, presentation, mainly monolithic deployments, meaning an entire tiny, big, monstrous uh, application being deployed somewhere. Um, some of those applications might evolve to those uh, services or microservices in the recent years, and we'll try to shed uh, more light on uh, that part. Uh, 
My apologies, I forgot to uh, mention in the beginning, if at any point in time you'll have any question, please let us know. Please interrupt us, please, or not only a question, maybe a remark, an objection, a comment, or anything. Maybe, or at any point during our slides, you will have an objection and you will say that you do not agree with those. We are more than welcome, they are more than welcome for us. So, by all means, please interrupt us. Don't throw anything at us, but we're just trying to convey some messages, so just ask us and we'll discuss them. <coughs> uh, those uh, applications are collaborating with any infrastructure services. They usually do not uh, live just by their own. They are collaborating with someone for data persistence, one or more databases, usually one. Data exchange, meaning messaging brokers or any other systems, synchronous and asynchronous communication. This starts to highlight this meaning uh, I don't see my pointer, but uh, somewhere those, that synchronous and asynchronous communication, hopefully we'll have time to get to that part. Because, sorry, in my opinion and in my experience, it's one of the biggest challenges. Not the first one, but one of the biggest technical challenges. I'll try to briefly summarize the um, differences between distributed systems and microservices. For what is worth mentioning, distributed systems existed as software uh, solutions for a very long time. For a very long time, I think approximately since we started, since the software industry started to uh, become enterprise and become bigger, we had distributed systems. Whenever you're doing a, a payment, that's a distributed system transaction so, or operation. It's not something handled by a single system. So not by anything, by any means new. Um, mainly a few deployment sizing and uh, management, uh, overall management differences between them. I'll start with the distributed systems, the services, a few actually applications, I wouldn't call them services, but mainly applications. One or two of them communicating with, with one database, meaning a central uh, domain model, pretty familiar for most of you. I would call and consider them traditional distributed systems or traditional, let's say, uh, enterprise systems, somewhere uh, uh, a mix of them. Running an entire application, having multiple services, communicating uh, via class calls, again, referring to the JVM, but not only to the JVM, but some other object-oriented uh, programming language. Deployed and running in a physical or virtual machines, the pretty standard way in the last couple of years was the deployment in a virtual machine, and whenever there was a need to do any sort of changes, people would connect to that virtual machine, they would change something in there, maybe redeploy the application, and all was well. Or at least pretty well with some downtime, with some headaches, with some, uh, with some overtime, but in the end, things were working. Uh, the data usage and the data sharing involved uh, several systems, uh, sharing a database if needed, so sharing the same data model. The new and uh, more uh, tiny and more granular and more hipster and more challenging uh, world, meaning the microservices, uh, a short uh, mention for them, that word micro, it's very debatable because it refers to the size of that uh, service, but it always, that size can differ depending on the needs of that type of service, so the domain needs, not on lines of code or number of classes. Those microservices are running a single business service. Uh, that's the emphasis or a single business service. Why? Because that's their, uh, uh, let's say, raison d'etre to have a single, exactly, to run a single business service and to allow the end users and, of course, the developers to make individual changes. As we will further see, the cost of change is one of the biggest drivers for eventually migrating. Those um, microservices are deployed, deployed and running, especially in containers, those uh, tiny, small uh, Docker or any other uh, containers usually managed by a uh, uh, containers management platform, either OpenShift or Kubernetes or anything else. Data usage, uh, each of those services has its own database in case it needs one. Why? Because they want to be able to make individual changes and to have a loose coupling between the services. That's one of the biggest promised benefits and one of the biggest, in the end, uh, um, gains from using this architecture, but it has a lot of trade-offs until getting there, and it has also on this uh, data usage, it brings two of the biggest uh, challenges, or the main challenges in my opinion. Uh, first of all, writing data consistently, and then reading data efficiently. So 
just two tiny, huge, actually huge uh, challenges. Can I just recap on the, and understand? Je vous en prie. See if I understand the message. So actually, microservices are a particular type of distributed system. Yes, but smaller, more smaller, grand order. Meaning that they can be rewritten if needed. Uh, ideally, yes. yes, of course. Written in any programming language, they are decoupled. They are loosely coupled. So just they have some, ideally, uh, well-defined uh, APIs between them. So contracts, and they will just discuss when between we using those contracts, and whenever a contract changes, that contract is mediated by the two parties or the several parties. So the guidelines or the essence of the communication between them is pretty well known and defined. Getting there, not the simplest thing to get there. So uh, you mentioned that they are, they are deployed uh, essentially through containers, but it could be through uh, virtual machines or serverless functions, but it happens that container is probably the best uh, uh, best tool? Uh, yes, from a series of reasons. Uh, one of the uh, reasons is their uh, loose coupling with the infrastructure. Those containers are not coupled to the infrastructure. Further all, their need for scaling uh, and their need for high availability. So a series of uh, characteristics, they are usually called in the software architecture elities because they are usually ending in elity. One of them is uh, um, availability, uh, scalability. Uh, and those are coming with some other challenges. So some gains, architectural gains, and not only architectural gains, but also um, deployment or f faster deployment gains, but with a huge series of huge trade-offs until getting there. Uh, as mentioned earlier, if at any point you have any questions, objections, comments, anything, please let us know. I'm trying to move a little bit uh, forward to get to the hopefully more... Uh, um, I don't know, um, light shedding aspects. The de deployments, data storage and communication models, uh, uh, just as a short comparison between them. Uh, on the monolithic architecture, as mentioned earlier, the entire app is assembled and then deployed as a single deployment unit, running in a single JVM, uh, of course, in a JVM. What that means, the bigger that uh, application becomes, the bigger that JVM uh, is. That means um, a, a tiny box becomes a huge box requiring memory, requiring resources, requiring uh, build and testing and a lot of times needed in there for uh, running that application uh, um, properly and uh, meaning having a reliable application. Those services usually communicating via simple class calls, by any means the most, uh, the fastest communication model, but the, also the most entangled model. Using data from one or more infrastructure services, we all know them, databases, messaging systems, any big data, any, I don't know, uh, LDAP systems or whatever else that might be needed. So applications communicating with infrastructure and performing the magic that is, uh, needed in those uh, software, in those enterprise contexts. Um, one or more external systems, it always depends on their need. Might communicate with some other systems, might not communicate, meaning outside of that uh, project. So easiest way to represent a, a huge box. Um, in case there might be, an, I don't know, potential question, how big is that box or how big that uh, that box can be? How successful was the project? Uh, exactly, we'll get to that very soon. Uh, it can get easily to a few, to millions of lines of code. Whenever a project reaches that stage, millions of lines of code, that is a huge box to manage. So that, that's not something easy to manage from a series of uh, software uh, considerations. The microservices architecture being the main alternative, um, I wouldn't say the only one, but the main alternative, uh, each service runs in its own lightweight JVM. So as mentioned, uh, how light it depends on the, uh, the size of that service. Those composing services are communicating through various inter-process communication uh, methods. Um, essentially, there are just two main ways for them to communicate. Uh, synchronous and asynchronous communication. Uh, the shortest summary for them, uh, half joke, half not. Uh, quick and dirty or long and painful? Quick and dirty. REST communication, everyone knows it. Long and painful asynchronous communication. Way more difficult, way more reliable. So a poison to pick from the beginning. 
and also use their own databases uh, if they need one. Most likely they will need one, but that also, it depends. And this comes the other challenge, as I mentioned, first of all, writing data consistently, and then reading data reliably. So two main, and that's the an attempt uh, to represent their uh, sizing and their interactions. So moving forward, just very briefly passing through the benefits uh, in case you'll ever wonder why those monolithic applications have been uh, successful for so many years and why they are still used, because they have a lot of benefits. So uh, a lot of benefits, simple to develop, uh, because uh, usually a lot of the ideas are oriented towards developing and maintaining a single application, although a huge application, easy to make those radical changes because everything is focused within a single, usually a single repository. Straightforward to test, more or less, uh, depending on the type of tests and depending on uh, the use cases, but pretty straightforward again because everything is localized within that huge box. Straightforward to deploy and run, again, we are building a single huge box and putting it somewhere and then is eventually replicating that. Easy to scale, uh, of course, whenever we need more um, uh, instances of that application because of Black Friday or because of whatever else, then we just clone that huge monster. So the bigger the monster, the bigger the box is, the more painful the uh, scaling, the more painful the everything. So uh, we'll get to uh, that very soon, but... Do we have an example of monolithic application that uh, we uh, managed to, let's say, uh, transition to microservices? Um, Big company? Uh... I can state just one of the biggest, uh, or maybe the, the best examples that I'm aware of, uh, one that is, I don't know how well known it is, but nevertheless hugely important. Uh, meaning Netflix. Uh, I won't ask the question if you're using Netflix, most likely there will be a lot of hands raised. Uh, in, I'm not sure if you knew or not, uh, Netflix was using a monolithic architecture until approximately 2012. Uh, in 2012, uh, there was a mistake. We are humans, we make mistakes. And someone, I don't know, changed a configuration file and their entire production system went down for, a, I don't know, for some time, their entire because they had that monolithic ar architecture. And they said at that point, well, we cannot continue in that way. So that was for them the trigger, the trigger to switch towards microservices. And they are not by any means the only uh, company that has successfully transitioned towards microservices. Amazon is using microservices since a very long time ago. eBay is also Airbnb, Uber, so many others. So there are a lot of success stories. Of course, not uh, intending to suffer from the survivorship bias. So not all of those transitions have been successful. Some of them have failed. Why? From a series of reasons. The, the so part... At this time, all these companies yes. were experiencing exponential growth on their, on yep. their business. So it makes sense for the scaling uh, aspect to transition to microservices. But if you are a company with, uh, let's say, a steady business, uh, okay, ex experiencing a linear growth. Why would you transition to microservices? Exactly the, the answer within the next couple of uh, minutes. I'll start by maybe with a summary. Uh, not that one, but uh, I'll, I'll start with the challenges and then we'll get to that. So challenges, organizational, first of all, in terms of management, then uh, technical uh, uh, cost of change. This is by far the biggest challenge for the monolithic architecture because for any change, there is a need for the application to be ideally thoroughly tested. Uh, hopefully not manually because again, we are humans, we make mistakes. Repackaged, redeployed, so we repack that huge monster and we reclone it and redeploy it. And then uh, with some downtime, that downtime might mean some loss of whatever that means for that uh, company. Single point of failure. As mentioned earlier, if a service fails in a fatal mode, it can stop the entire JVM, not just one JVM, but all of those JVMs at uh, Netflix uh, um, had the chance to, to, um, to experience, I see. Then also scaling becomes more difficult as the deployment size grows. As mentioned earlier, we are no longer cloning that tiny thing, but we are cloning not this box, but maybe, I don't know, this room. So it's very difficult. But also the need to use a single technology, that's uh, no, not necessarily a, a, a huge or one of the biggest uh, uh, challenges or trade-offs, but progressively that technology might be deprecated or, I don't know, m might no longer be uh, easily to maintain. 
Um, I'll uh, continue with uh, the summary that I've mentioned earlier, uh, and the very important one. Nothing fails like success. Um, what does that mean? Um, I hear some thoughts. It means that uh, uh, there won't ever be any application in this world that will reach a point to even consider migrating to microservices if it is not successful. So only successful applications will ever at least consider should we transition to them. If an application, and this answers your question, if an application is good enough with a monolithic architecture, then so be it. Leave it like that, leave it to just that huge box that, as long as that huge box is still manageable in terms of cost of change, in terms of anything dealing with it. But if the maintenance of that big box becomes too, um, too heavy, usually that too heavy means dollar-wise, then maybe considering this. But in my opinion, it's extremely important to, uh, to acknowledge that there won't ever be the case to, for a medium successful application to even consider microservices. That's just, I don't know, an excess of, uh, I don't know, ego or something. So let's transition to microservices. Why? Because they are nice. No. No. So um, there might be a case that successful projects might outgrow that monolithic architecture. Why? As mentioned earlier, because they are successful, as Emag was, or as a lot of others, Uber, Airbnb, and so on. There will be a lot of new features added. There will be uh, uh, the development teams will grow. So the code base growth rate, the management overhead. Not sure if you're familiar, but <clears throat> the management overhead is one of the main reasons why Amazon recommends two pizza teams. The two pizza team, one of my favorite uh, terms, partially funny. It means that uh, a pizza should be small or big enough uh, so that it can be fed by two pizzas. And the Every time question, even those huge pizzas, no, those regular pizzas, so keep them small. It just resolves, revolves to the overhead of communicating back and forth between a lot of people. So some applications may evolve into those uh, uh, too difficult to maintain monoliths and then get into a monolithic hell when everything is just slow and painful. I have seen, uh, and maybe you have also seen this uh, so many times, I tried to work with uh, at least two huge, I wouldn't call them monsters, but huge boxes. One of them had approximately 2.5 million of lines of code, the other one had around seven. That's just plain nightmares to try to... Yeah, I fully agree. Uh, we had uh, in this bank that... Uh, we, uh, we worked for for a couple of years. Uh, one of the most successful applications was a monolithic application. That, at, precisely because it has been successful, had millions of lines of code and more and more functions exactly. added exactly. Uh, years after years. It was deployed uh, like uh, with a special teams on a weekly, uh, on a, on, during a weekend, every with a calendar that was very uh, specific because everything was manual and it was not possible to uh, have this uh, automated and independent deployment that uh, microservices can, uh, can afford. Exactly, so, exactly. So, but, and any attempt to fix or change something within uh, that application, I've witnessed that uh, firsthand, was an absolute nightmare, absolute nightmare. So getting there, if a project reaches that point, any, it, there are just three possible approaches, just three. Of course, an opinion is not declaring it as a universal truth. Maintaining that uh, architecture, so maintaining that uh, huge uh, monolithic, of course, with the benefits and challenges, so just maintaining that box, trying to chop things, or not chop, but adding small things to it, patching it, so until it hurts too much. Again, hurting means in terms of costs. Uh, splitting it into some smaller modules or mini monoliths, that's a part of what Nicolas re was referring to, just uh, defining or splitting into oh, those. A partial transition, I think that's the idea. A that partial transition, of course. This morning. But whenever we are discussing about uh, splitting a box, a huge box into those tiny or not so tiny boxes, we are automatically uh, um, considering or we must consider the need for communication between them. They communicate exactly from the same reason as we people are communicating, in order to collaborate. That's the only reason. So whenever they need to communicate, that's where the, the complexities appear. Or migrate into microservices, as mentioned. The first two might be just delaying it. 
until when? Until it will be good enough. So again, there isn't a golden rule. You must or should transition towards microservices when an application reaches that point. There might be a case that an application will never reach that point. So all is well. Getting to my, uh, my favorite comparison between the two. So the monolith versus the microservices, that's, an, of course, a nice uh, uh, or more uh, humane or fishy, let's say, presentation, uh, mm, depiction of them. The eventual solution, so uh, transitioning to the microservices architecture, meaning getting to that huge uh, box towards those uh, tiny boxes. So hopefully the context until uh, this point has been clear enough in terms of why, what, when, where, how, how we haven't got to the how, we will just briefly, or as much as the time will allow us to discuss about the how. From, until this point, it was an attempt to um, explain or to provide more context uh, to those uh, um, aspects. Should we start, should we transition? As mentioned, if there are any questions, challenges, objections, please let us know. Um, a short, very short overview for them, a short, uh, let's say, um, definitions. Um, Service-oriented architecture composed from some services that have bounded context. The bounded context in here, it's a term from domain-driven design, one of the main uh, um, techniques for uh, splitting an application. And bounded essentially means just uh, using or just implementing the needs of a certain service. So that's the the... Um, summary of that bounded. Also, architectural style that functionally decomposes a project in a set of independently deployable services. So uh, the holy grail of those uh, microservices is this independently deployable services. What does that mean more exactly? Having the possibility to frequently deploy uh, changes, bug fixes, or new features in production, ideally without interrupting the end user. Uh, of course, there are a lot of aspects in here, not only the CI and CD, but and the uh, deployment uh, platform, whatever, so Kubernetes or anything, it might be in there. But in the end, the whole cycle time is intended to be greatly reduced. So that's the end benefit, not having to spend weeks or months until a certain set of changes, bug fixes or new features, can be deployed into production. Um, most important one uh, briefly mentioned, enable the continuous delivery and deployment of those large and complex applications. So not having to redeploy the whole huge box, either this one or that one or whatever, it might be this box whenever there is a change. And those services, small, of course it depends, easily maintainable, independently deployable and scalable, and uh, enables those teams to be autonomous. By autonomous, as mentioned earlier, uh, we are referring to the um, necessity for those services to have a contract defined between them, either a synchronous or asynchronous communication contract, and those services are just communicating using those, uh, those established contracts. And whenever there is a change, they are discussing and mediating those changes. Also, easy experimenting because it's much easier to just adopt or uh, at least prototype with a new technology or try something else because it will at least theoretically affect just one service or just a set of those services. And better fault isolation because there is no single point of failure, although I've placed it last in this slide. In my opinion, this is one of the biggest uh, benefits because an application will no longer be in two states, either available or unavailable. That application, in case something is not working properly, and there are uh, all the time cases when something is not working properly, that uh, the state of that application will become just degraded, not unavailable. That's a huge difference between being degraded and unavailable. Je vous en prie. So, yeah, so it means also that uh, with this transition to microservices, you need to scale up your uh, monitoring capability, all your of logs, cross check, uh, communication. Of course. Said was, uh, of course. Of course. Uh, first of all, there will no longer be, that's usually also the case for the monolithic uh, deployments, uh, not a single instance. So several instances, if one is not available because hardware will always fail, there are the others that will handle. So the, let's say, worst that can happen for such, such a project is that 
some functionality will be partially degraded. A very, or two very common uh, cases from two uh, contexts that I'm aware of, the payment, or maybe, I don't know, the warehousing functionality not working for an online uh, shop, whatever that is, or for an uh, air ticketing company not being able to see the number of available, or in real time, the number of available seats. So these are just, but just partially degraded. Moving forward, um, more efficient, more granular, resilient, less costly, and less prone to big bang changes, but these will, are the end benefits, so not the path to get there. And each of those services having the possibility to use different technologies based on the business needs and based on the development team skills. Definitely the business needs should be the main driver for uh, deciding the, those services. Um, just from my personal uh, experience, I have collaborated with a project which had one of those, their services written in R because it was highly efficient for what they needed. So that's a perfect example. Data science project? Sorry? A data science project, machine learning project, we say R. R, yeah. that R, it's a programming, programming, pre programming or scripting language, but it's more data uh, science related. So very powerful. That's just one example. Very simple, well, an attempt to visually depict them. The end user will access a certain project uh, through a series of, uh, through a configuration layer, which has a series of uh, services running there, an application layer, which has all of those services communicating between them, and communicating also with the infrastructure. So essentially, any uh, microservices-based uh, project will contain these three layers. Now, uh, how they are hosted, how they are being deployed, uh, this is beyond the scope of this uh, uh, application, uh, sorry, the, this presentation. The essence of what we are trying to, what, what we will try to uh, discuss is the, a way to um, decide the migration process based on these two layers. So we'll try to, to explain them. But we'll start with, in my opinion, the biggest or the most important part, the phases or the stages from that migration, for that migration. First of all, one of the biggest uh, uh, challenges and one of the most important uh, challenges is the services decomposition. Because that huge box must be decomposed where all of those services were being uh, written and they were running in an entangled, embraced, naturally or not way. They will need to be split into those uh, um, mini or microservices. There is a process for doing that. It is a trial and error process. It is iterative and incremental. It is not something that can be, at least for now, uh, automated. When the AI will learn to do that, maybe we'll have to, I don't know, uh, we'll uh, either have to uh, find something else to work, maybe, or uh, we will uh, look at the monolithic applications in the museums. And we will tell our children, you know, some time ago, some years ago, there were those huge things called monoliths, and they would just look like a dinosaurs. They existed? Yes, they existed. They are in the museums. But we are not there. When will we get there? We don't know. We don't know. Right? I don't think that's something that can be predicted. That's, that's interesting, this comment on the, the fact that it's very difficult to find the boundaries of a microservice. When, we, when I look at all the, the tutorials online that exist, they always come with this e-commerce e, uh, e website. So it's always the same type of, uh, of a project where you have the customer, you have the basket, you have uh, uh, the inventory. So these are very simple use case. When you look at the variety of use cases that we may have encountered in our professional life, defining what is the microservices and where it shall stop is really challenging. Totally agreed. I consider uh, the, the differences, uh, essentially the difference between a trailer and the movie. The trailer looks so nice, whoa, okay, but when the movie, whoa, well, it could have been better. The same with that, those phases, or with those, let's say, uh, simplistic approaches. So, first of all, we decompose that huge monster into those tiny monsters, which are communicate, not monsters, but just boxes. Then we will need to establish two oh, hugely important uh, details, both related to the communication and collaboration between those services how they, are, they will communicate, as mentioned earlier, uh, either synchronously or uh, asynchronously, and also their data storage model, because essentially they can use either the same databases, uh, database, which comes with some headaches and benefits, 
<coughs> or different databases, which comes with others ben other benefits and trade and uh, headaches. So, not a uh, an, uh, one size fits all solution. Again, if there would have been such a one size fits all solution, we would see those monoliths in the museums. We are not there. And after, sorry, not passing that uh, that fast because, uh, in my opinion, this is by far the the most elaborated uh, um, part. Uh, one of the, in my opinion, nice aspects or uh, nice in at least one way, for writing that data consistently within a distributed system, uh, there is a pattern you might have heard about it, the Saga pattern. The Saga pattern is a pattern uh, uh, software. Uh, software pattern, architectural pattern that can be used in order to write data consistently in a distributed system. And the nice, at least for me, part is that that uh, pattern is by not any is not by any means new. It exists since 1987. So as someone said, like good old wine. So those patterns exist like good old wine since a very long time, not something new. Then after uh, hopefully um, the, uh, let's defining the communication and collaboration between the services, establishing their uh, contracts, uh, the, uh, establishing the data model and uh, writing data consistently and reading data uh, reliably, uh, then we need to uh, consider and to implement a lot of aspects related to testing, security, resilience, and all, all of, of course a lot of infrastructure aspects. So testing those services, uh, as we well know, testing, especially the automated testing part, is one of the most, in my opinion and experience, one of the most taboo aspects from uh, the software development. I think most developers, whenever there is a discussion about software testing, they are more so testing. Let, let's skip that, that subject. Securing the application, we need to secure our application, so hopefully there is no need for discussing the reasoning why. Making that communication resilient, again, uh, it's a matter of either making the synchronous communication resilient, which means using a lot of uh, uh, resilience patterns, so a series of headaches, or using the asynchronous communication which comes with a, with a different set of challenges. So again, not something that is um, by default easy or simple to do. And then integrating a lot of infrastructure patterns monitoring, uh, tracing, um, observing the metrics and so on. So a lot of infrastructure and let's say um, auxiliary aspects. So um, challenges for them, uh, trying to summarize uh, them in a more, um, let's say, quick uh, summary way. Finding the right set of services uh, is, uh, can be or is very challenging. So domain-driven design can be used for that because it helps with a lot of, uh, of um, um, terms, with a lot of concepts, especially related to bounded context, but also uh, the communication between them. Essentially, each service is mapped to one bounded context, which will interact with the others, and they have just their own set of uh, functionalities. So finding that right set of services will almost always require an iteration. So not something that we start from the beginning, we craft, we identify those services and they are just, uh, I avoid the word perfect, but they are good enough. We need to iterate to get to the, to the good enough. Um, distributed systems, of course, by their nature are complex. So anything related development, testing and deployment will be inherently more difficult. If you want to say anything or just... No, I'm fine. Uh, Yes, so uh, complex nature by design, complex nature by its, let's say, complex um, a complexity by having a lot of granular parts which are interacting with the others. Um, Features that are spanning across several services will always uh, require coordination because there is a need to coordinate between several teams. As I mentioned, uh, writing data and reading data, but in here I would also add uh, maintaining contracts complexity, communication, and collaboration. That's one of the, my favorite uh, uh, aspects. Uh, in the end, the biggest challenge is exactly the same as for us, for humans. Communication and collaboration. Those services are communicating from the exact same reason why we are communicating, or not sometimes, in order to collaborate. They are not communicating because they are good friends or high school, uh, I don't know, colleagues or 
something else, they are communicating because of a business need. So the challenge is, is pretty much the same. Communication in order communicate in order to collaborate. Uh, deciding when to adopt them again might be difficult, and in my opinion, uh, although I'm not an uh, an adept of reactive actions, uh, the decision when to adopt those microservices is usually or should be a reactive one. So reactive one because, as mentioned, there is a certain point, a certain difficulty point, or there might be uh, for every project whenever it will consider that maybe it's better to transition. But maybe it's better to transition, it's not something, or should not be something uh, driven by the uh, the um, shininess of those CVs or by the, how hipster those technologies are. No, because that technology, because that project is uh, struggling. And uh, running and integration and component tests uh, within that huge infrastructure is more challenging. Bogdan, can we stay for one second on this slide? Je vous en prie. Uh, the more I'm looking at it, the, the, should we consider, let's say, start with a template for this uh, for the microservices that we are using? See that we don't mention this question. Start with a template? Yes. Like a template of micro, uh, microservice. But as mentioned, tried to mention uh, a few slides before, we should never start from them. So a project that exists should just stay in there and then consider those stages. Uh, so these stages in order to transition. First of all, decompose them, then make them talk, make them write data and save data, and then test them and integrate them, everything. So th that's why I try to, to uh, I'm trying to understand what template are you referring to for migrating them or for? No, for, for, the, for each microservice. Um, yes, the, there is an entire uh, um, process for doing that. It starts from identifying system operations. So every application has a system operation. Placing an order, that's a system operation. Uh, seeing my order, I have ordered two pizzas, uh, that's uh, an, a system operation. So those system operations are mapped or they need to be mapped to one or more services, implementing services. One of them is the owning service, the other ones are the collaborators. So there is a pretty, pretty straightforward process for assigning those system operations to services. Not sure if we'll have enough time for doing that, but there is a template for doing Yeah, Yeah, we won't have. But there is a template, a pretty, much, uh, a pretty straightforward template for uh, mapping system operations to those, um, to those services, the collaborating services. And again, referring to, uh, sorry, actually it's fast forward a little bit, to those bounded contexts. This is a, a very simple uh, image of two uh, bounded context, so as mentioned, uh, an, uh, a concept from domain-driven design. Uh, essentially, each of those services has a series of, uh, has a uh, bounded context, a context in which those terms are meaningful for that service. Uh, in this uh, uh, simple image, there is a delivery and there is a finance uh, or finances bounded context. Each one of them is uh, working with a customer, but that customer means different a different thing uh, in finances and in the delivery. So essentially, uh, each of them have a, an ubiquitous language. They are speaking about some, um, some concepts, so some domain concepts, but those concepts are interpreted differently because, I don't know, for finances, uh, the customer has uh, uh, some details stored in there. For the delivery, that customer has just the address. So they are differently, semantically different. So that's one of the challenges of identifying them and then identifying the relationships between them, the communication between those uh, those bounded contexts. So somehow what you're telling us is that the, the, the boundaries of our microservices are fuzzy. They depend on the way we are defined and... Definitely. Especially in the beginning, they are very fuzzy. So that's why uh, chopping that uh, monolith, meaning splitting it, it's not a straightforward process. It's an iterative and incremental, and it, re it requires a few iterations. Um, a, few, a series of um, microservices architectural patterns. Uh, so in order to be able to create that whole uh, um, architecture so and to uh, follow those stages after the initial uh, splitting, we need, or it is useful to use a lot of architectural patterns and components and practices. 
uh, two um, macro categories that I'll try to briefly summarize. So application patterns and applica three actually. Application infrastructure patterns and infrastructure patterns. Uh, application patterns are entirely related to development. Application infrastructure patterns are partially mapped to the infrastructure. Asynchronous communication, that's one of them. And infrastructure patterns are almost entirely related to the infrastructure. So essentially, mapping on those two layers that we mentioned earlier. So having an, uh, an uh, overview for them, as we mentioned, the application contained or composed from those services is interacting with a series of infrastructure services and uh, they are both, uh, or, yes, these two conceptual layers, uh, properly maintaining them um, would benefit a lot from using a series of patterns from these three categories. Again, trying to quickly summarize them and uh, also to quickly draw a series of uh, categories and priorities with a, an explicit mention that this is a subjective priority. So uh, there isn't any microservices transitioning uh, committee in this world or in this galaxy, at least we're not aware of, that will decide that this is the priority. So that's why it's just a subjective one. As mentioned earlier, definitely starting with planning and design. So planning and design services decomposition. This is not by any means any uh, phase that we can or should uh, uh, neglect because it's not optional. Then establishing a few uh, complementary aspects, service discovery, external API, and some cross-cutting concerns. So first of all, decomposing those uh, applications, uh, sorry, the the services, and then set up setting up the necessary infrastructure, a minimal infrastructure at least from the, for the beginning. Then the development and testing phases, as mentioned earlier, the biggest um, challenge, again, um, subjective uh, perception, establishing the communication style. Um, for a lot of developers, at least for my uh, uh, from my experience. Whenever there is a discussion about two uh, services communicating, that they are communicating automatically goes, or they are automatically mapped to a synchronous communication, REST communication. Why? Because it's easy. Because it's fast, because it's easy. Uh, but the way more reliable one, hopefully we'll, not sure if we'll have time for that, is the asynchronous communication. So we need to be aware about them. Then data management, writing data, and reading data, as mentioned earlier, the second biggest um, challenge, highly influenced by the communication style. So they are definitely um, intertwined, and they, uh, they are definitely um, influencing. The communication style will, affect, will uh, influence the data management. Uh, testing, that taboo topic from the software development world. So establishing the communication style, implementing the business logic uh, within all of those services, um, writing data and reading data, and gen then testing those services and their integration. And then deployment and monitoring for those services, series of deployment patterns, observing those, uh, observing those uh, services, of course, and that means a whole CI and CD infrastructure. Monitoring and observing those services, uh, which is in itself a big, a uh, section or a big, uh, big challenge. Je vous en prie, monsieur. Yeah, I feel that this is the most added value of uh, all this uh, transition to microservices. The, the ability to deploy independently uh, new, I mean, services with new features uh, independently from the others. Yep. Um, being fully aware that the wow factor is a human uh, attraction, being something that is wow. Uh, there is an, an um, let's say, stated uh, or uh, uh, marketed uh, number by Amazon. Uh, they said that some time ago they were deploying uh, their changes into production every 12 seconds. So in an average of 12 seconds without affecting the end user. That is, in my opinion, absolutely incredible. I mean, in the monolithic world uh, without uh, a minimum one week or two weeks, let's say two weeks, I think it's uh, optimistic. No, merci. That's not possible. But from at least two weeks towards 12 seconds, that's huge. That's huge. So the end benefit, being able to quickly deploy, which is, again, um, going back to, try to quickly go back to that slide. 
because it's hopefully um, emphasizing the, the reason. Here it is, cost of change. So it comes back to cost of change. So quickly, fast forwarding to it, and uh, uh, from here on it will be an, uh, an overview of, uh, sorry, didn't want to do that. It would be an overview of synchronous and asynchronous communication mm, for the, for the last three minutes, not sure if we'll have enough time for that, but hopefully we started to at least uh, at a high level um, um, start to summarize the differences between them. Je vous en prie, monsieur. Thank you very much. I have nothing to add. <laughs> Any questions, comments, objections, courtesies? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes. They are decoupled, you can uh, test them individually. Uh, it doesn't imply to do a large setup in order to can test uh, one component. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I'll try to answer it from at least two perspectives. Um, Testing it overall, it might be, but we need to be, I'm scrolling back towards get to that slide. We need to be aware that in order to test any functionality, to do a component testing, we need to deploy those, those services from here. So may, most likely the challenge is not necessarily in the testing per se, but in having all those services, all those services that need to be tested, deployed together. We can always mock them. We can, we can mock the, the collaboration between all the services? Yes, Still, we can. It's a lot of uh, integration We can testing. mock them, but mocking, usually it's in the integration testing. So component testing, uh, at least for my understanding or to my knowledge, means actually deploying those services. So testing a certain component, a certain functionality, in order to reliably test it, we would need to deploy those. Have I answered your, your question? Not that much in towards testing per se, but more in towards deploying those components. You don't seem to, to, to be satisfied with the answer. Uh, you can test certain components without uh, being involved in the deployment process, no? I, I don't, at least I'm not referring now at the tests that are running at the build and deploy uh, process on mm -hmm. the continuous integration uh, pipeline. Just uh, to the component testing that you are doing on your, uh, one of your microservices. Maybe there it might be a, sh a small, uh, not a confusion, but a different understanding of component testing versus integration testing. Integration testing means testing a single service in isolation to, with the others, I mean from the others, as my, uh, Nicola said, uh, mocking the behavior of the other services. And component testing means uh, testing a certain uh, functionality by having those components in there. That's my, my understanding at least, that's my knowledge of them. That's my, uh, yes, understanding of it. That's why I said that maybe we understand a little bit different what component I think yes. Yeah. Because yeah. for me, the integration testing is exactly the integration between the components, not mocking the other components by the way they are interacting uh, between each other. Uh, I would uh, I, I propose to have a, a further conversation on this. Let's see, maybe right now. But uh, it, it's certainly a very good topic, and we'll, I would love to clarify if there is a confusion in there between the integration and component. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Maybe you can, uh, ah, you need uh, the mic. Hey, I have a quick question on the um, infrastructure side of the microservices. Yeah. When building microservices, of course you add a lot of complexity. You have more, more services to manage, to observe, to um, collect data from. Uh, what's your take when you are migrating from a monolithic application to microservices? Should you create first an infrastructure which is modern, provides observability, centralized log, um, centralized logging, and all the primitives required to build microservices, or you should go um, with 
like just split it in microservices, put them on servers, and then figure it out how to uh, how to optimize the infrastructure side. Uh, thanks a lot. Very good question. Um, my opinion is that uh, if we are trying to build all of those uh, infrastructure aspects, monitoring, logging, uh, tracing, uh, uh, metrics, and so on, the overall development will be much slower, much more reliable, but much slower. And this uh, goes very much into what Nicolas said uh, for the uh, business side of a project. Most of the time, they will want to see something functioning. Not with logs and metrics and having everything glued together, but having something, having a benefit from that transitioning process. If we are doing that, then we need to be aware that that process will take longer. If we'll at least partially postpone the integration of all of those infrastructure aspects, they, meaning the business um, side of a project, might see the end result uh, faster. Is this enough? I mean, is this providing? So, it's a perspective. That's that. So. And one of the biggest patterns that we need to choose uh, uh, in, in a lot of aspects is to pick your poison, our poison. So again, we need to pick, we as a team, meaning we need to pick one poison. Either we deliver something a little bit faster, but it won't have monitoring metrics and all those goodies. So we won't see anything in Grafana and we won't see all of those nice graphs, but we will deliver something. Or we can have all of those nice logs and graphs and we will see them in whatever Grafana, IELTS stack or whatever. But the business part will maybe when? Well, we're working on metrics and, and observability, but when? It's a trade-off. Golden solution for this, I'm not aware of it. I don't think it exists. As mentioned, if a lot of these challenges would already have some templates of some solutions, museums, monoliths, we had them 20 years ago, dinosaurs, but we're not there. Thank you. Can I answer? I think I will come back to the Je comment I, I made, and I think it's uh, uh, the conclusion we are uh, we are pushing, and the conclusion of uh, some of the presentation that we attended today is that one of the benefits of microservices is precisely uh, all the, the new development on infrastructure. So if you don't have all these containers, this ability to deploy autonomously uh, in, autom in an automated manner, I mean the point of a microservice is very limited. So uh, yes, I uh, I fully agree. It should be taken from the from day one. The the selection on uh, and the, the the right infrastructure is very important. Totally agreed. We should. I'm not debating in any way that we should take it from the beginning. The only point that I'm trying to emphasize is that if we take all of those aspects from the beginning, the whole development or the whole uh, let's say migration process will be almost unavoidably smaller. Uh, sorry, slower. So if that is uh, accepted and everyone agrees and uh, welcomes that, by all means, let's integrate things from the beginning and let's have uh, everything uh, properly. If, I don't know, if there would be an, I don't want to say an uh, unlimited time or unlimited budget. Let, let's face it, Bogdan, but there, there is, a, uh, when, when this, uh, let's say, this liter literature from all these experts, Martin Fowler, etc., uh, came uh, and, and talked about how to do a transition from a monolithic to a mm -hmm. application to, to microservices, it was at the time before public cloud. It was before we had this ability to uh, have all this uh, uh, computing power, all this everything on request. So I, I think it's, uh, it's important that uh, all these uh, uh, discussions are being updated in a context that most of the, com the companies want to go to, to the public cloud. It's part of their strategy. That's the main point. And if you don't integrate into that with your transition to uh, microservices, what's the point? I agree, but only partially. And I will mention why partially. Because at least on this layer, on the infrastructure la layer, I am aware about at least three domains, huge domains, in which the owners of those companies and then those uh, projects are not even considering going into public clouds. No mercy all the way. Why? Another discussion. But they are just staying within their infrastructure. So from a reuse it or do it yourself approach, they would prefer and choose, deliberately choose, a do it by themselves. And then th that choice in itself goes into a different direction. So if we're going to a public cloud with all of its bells and whistles, agreed, if that project is willing to go there. We haven't even touched that aspect. That's another, hopefully it, it makes sense that both are valid, but ça dépend, again.
Ladies, gentlemen, any other question or objection or comment? Please. Into monolithic, uh, into microservices. Do you maybe have the total number of all the codes, <laughs> lines of the code at the end? Uh, first of all, to, to try to, to um, fully give that context, that uh, application existed and it exists, but it hasn't even considered the transitioning. It hasn't even considered, not, bec that. not because of the developers. The developers would have started that two months ago, yeah. but the business was just looking at it, no. Yeah. And if it, if it was working, I mean, it wasn't uh, so painful we'll enough. Come back to, uh, to this comment that I was making at the beginning. You need to convince the, the business stakeholders. If exactly. your, your application is experiencing a linear growth, if you don't for need microservices. Yeah. Microservices are here so that you can scale your system on, on demand. If so for them the, there isn't a, a high enough pain, so if it's not hurting too much, honestly, in terms of time and in terms of money, money usually. Why? If it's working like that, that application won't ever, will stay like that. It will just, I don't know, be a pain to maintain it. Uh, to quote someone, there isn't a lot of development being done within that project, but it will survive yeah. because there is no business need for it to. That's all. So, I, honestly, I would have preferred to tell you the success story of that application, but there isn't any. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's just interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for, uh, for attending. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, thank you. Hopefully, it shed some light. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. From, from the two of us.